Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Harvard School of Public Health's Decision Making, Voices from the Field. My name is Michael Chaitkin, and I'm a master's candidate in the Department of Health Policy and Management and member of the Student Leadership Circle Committee, which collaborates with the Division of Policy Translation and Leadership Development to host this webcast series. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Mr. Gabriel Jaramillo. A titan of banking, Mr. Jaramillo earned his reputation for superlative leadership of complex organizations as an executive in numerous financial institutions. In his more than 35-year career, he held senior posts at Marine Midland Bank, Citibank, and Sovereign and Santander Holdings, where he served as chairman and CEO from 2009 to 2011. He is best known to us, however, for his contributions to global health. In early 2011, the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria found itself the subject of intensive political and media scrutiny for allegedly widespread corruption and waste throughout its operations. Mr. Jaramillo, who was then serving as advisor to the UN Special Envoy for Malaria, was asked to join a high-level independent panel to examine the Global Fund's fiduciary controls and oversight mechanisms. On the basis of the panel's findings, the Global Fund's board devised an ambitious four-year strategy and in early 2012 selected Mr. Jaramillo as the organization's first general manager to oversee initial stages of implementation. In less than a year, Mr. Jaramillo thoroughly reorganized the Global Fund, reducing staff and overhauling systems to strengthen grant management, improve efficiency, and tighten financial supervision. In late 2013, his successor presided over the Global Fund's most lucrative replenishment conference to date. $12 billion in donor pledges were no doubt a tribute to Mr. Jaramillo's transformative leadership. A native of Colombia and citizen of Brazil, Mr. Jaramillo holds degrees in marketing and business administration from California State University. He is currently the Menchel Senior Leadership Fellow here at HSPH and is teaching a course on turnaround management in NGOs. Before I turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Ichiro Kawachi, please join me in welcoming ha Mr. Hanamio to the Voices from the Field Leadership Series at the Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for that uh, introduction. And uh, welcome again, uh, Gabrielle, to Voices from the Field, which is a webcast series that uh, introduces students to issues of leadership. Now, um, Gabriel, you, you have uh, described yourself as a banker who has uh, learned to speak the language of health. And uh, after 36 years in the private banking sector, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what uh, led to your decision to become involved in eradicating malaria? Thank you, Shirin. Thank you very much for the introduction, Michael. Uh, how you make a turn in life, I, I wanted to uh, give back. I, was, I have been lucky all my life. I was born in a little town in the Andes in Colombia. Um, I still can't explain to myself what I'm doing here today uh, in this illustrious institution. And yet, uh, there's this feeling that you want to contribute. Uh, so when I finished my career in banking and I was uh, thinking, how am I going to do something differently and uh, have a positive impact? I remember a conversation I had had with a person that became my mentor in global health at a Yankee Stadium uh, game. And this person on my side uh, in the chit-chatting uh, along the game uh, explained to me that uh, he had dedicated or was dedicating his time and efforts on uh, finishing malaria deaths by 2015. I didn't know what malaria was really besides being something that had been around for a long time. And uh, it seemed very crazy that somebody would think that, uh, you know, living in New York, from there they could actually uh, have this great impact. And this, for the following five years, uh, continued on my head and just worked on me. And when I decided to make a move, I decided to locate this person that I had met in this game and uh, made contact through another person because I didn't know if this person remembered uh, our meeting at the game. And so uh, half an hour after having the conversation with a third person that would get us in contact, I got a call. And uh, he said, this is Ray Chambers, and I'm returning uh, your call, and this and the other. I said, oh, you do remember? And he said, yes, I do remember. I just don't know why it took you so long to call back. <laughs> and so uh, that's how it all started. 
and uh, so I ended up in the drive uh, and that uh, I think it's a fascinating uh, enterprise which is to end malaria, malaria deaths by well, 2015. Well, as a um, lifelong Red Sox fan, I, I'm just glad that uh, something good can come out of visiting Yankee Stadium. You know, so, <laughs> no story. I mean, seriously though, uh, that, that, that your, your, your story, your story uh, reminds me, you know, there's, there's a sort of a Japanese saying attributed to the um, 16th century uh, master of tea ceremony called Sen no Rikyu, and the, the phrase says, Ichigo Ichie, which means one meeting, one chance. And um, I think it's a wonderful story of how these fleeting moments in life can lead to transformative change in one's personal life and, uh, and the rest of the world. So um, uh, the, uh, in 2011, as Michael uh, mentioned, uh, the Global Fund appeared to be in a bit of trouble. Uh, and as we know, they announced that the cancellation of round 11 of uh, fund making and um, that was the context in which you were brought on board to turn the institution around. Now, for those of you who've been paying attention, the title of the session is "If It Works, Fix It," which um, seems, you know, a little bit contradictory. All of us are taught uh, if it's broke, if it's fixed, you know, if it's working, don't um, try to fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Is the uh, usual leadership uh, mantra. But um, can you explain to us um, the situation you found at the Global Fund when you took over the helm? What was working and needed fixing, and what wasn't working and required your key reforms to turn around? So the Global Fund was a great idea, and it came about in 2002 uh, with a lot of wisdom behind it, and it's one of the few ideas that really worked. It was a grandiose idea, and it produced what it was supposed to produce. And in the first 10 years, it saved close to 10 million lives. It engaged 140 countries in the fight against these diseases. It mobilized billions of dollars. Health goods prices came down dramatically. Industrial scale up of health goods went up in a way never seen before. Um, fascinating experience, fascinating organization. Yet, uh, what happened? Uh, times had changed. When the, World Bank, when the uh, Global Fund was formed, it was formed with a great sense of generosity, a, a great sense of emergency and fear and solidarity. And with that context, um, the organization got moving and achieved what I have explained to you. Yet, times have changed and there was no longer an emergency and there was no longer, by 2010, fear. No head of state of the G8 feared that AIDS was a threat to the human race. They knew it was a big problem, and it was a bigger problem in one place and a lesser problem in another, but there was no fear. It was not the priority that it was at the beginning. And so what was left was the sense of generosity, and with that sense alone, the expectations changed on the fund, and the leaders failed to recognize this change, this change in the environment. And this is what leaders do. Leaders are supposed to be visionaries, and they're supposed to be able to see what's really happening and what the trends are, and being able to translate those trends into simple messages and translate them into action so that organizations uh, are, are always responding in the way they're supposed. And what management and the leadership of the fund did when confronted with this difficulty of fraud being found in its activities and disclosed and becoming a big brouhaha, but what really was happening was that times had changed and the donors were requiring that fiduciary uh, aspects of putting money to work in 140 countries in the uh, most extreme and difficult corners of the world, it had to be done in a different way. It had to be done with a different rigor, and, and this is what really the major problem was. And the leadership lesson here is that's what le leaders do. You have to read the smoke signals. You have to read the times. You have to translate that, and you have to translate it into action and in a way that people understand that something great is always changing because it's the environment that is changing. Mm, wonderful. I mean, 
looking back on your life, um, it seems that uh, you have been involved in a series of uh, rescues of distressed organizations. I mean, first you did this in the private banking sector in uh, Brazil, and of course for those of us in the Commonwealth, we remember when uh, Gabriel came on board to uh, be at the helm of the Sovereign Bank and turned it around in the space of a couple of years. Uh, and then he did, went off to um, Geneva to do the same thing for the Global f Fund in um, the space of um, 12 months. What, what's your secret? I mean, <laughs> what, what, is there, are there lessons um, here that are transferable from uh, managing private sector uh, organizations to the public sector? Or are there, what are the differences and what are the similarities that you're able to apply in, in, this, in these cases? So I don't think it's a secret, but because all these things are so intuitive, but I mm. did uh, prove for myself something that I, that I was pretty convinced that it was like that. It's the transformations are about people because it's people that do things. Mm. And, and you can apply that to a chemical company or to any kind of enterprise. Mm. And so I applied that to uh, transformations in the financial system. And then when I went to Geneva uh, to uh, undertake the transformation of the Global Fund, I was pretty comfortable uh, knowing that, not arrogant, but comfortable that I didn't have to know about AIDS and malaria and TB and global health and health systems. What I had to know was about people because it was people that were going to make the changes that were required. Mm. And so it's around that concept mm. that I, I mobilized and I have mobilized all my life mm. in terms of uh, bringing uh, a change into organizations. Mm. Wonderful. I mean, wh one other um, quality of leadership seems to me to, to understand the values, the values of the organization, the values of the people working in them. Now, you have said uh, in, in an HBS interview I read that um, you perceive a fundamental difference in the values of the private sector and the values of the public sector. Specifically that uh, in the private sector, it's the individual, it's the organization which is uh, put ahead of the individual, whereas it may not be the case in public sector organizations. The, can you elaborate on that concept? I mean, was it, uh, That's a good was question. it was there a relevance when you took over the Global Fund? That's a, that's a very good question. I, I learned a lot, uh, of course, uh, uh, working at the Global Fund uh, and leading the transformation. Uh, and one of the things that I learned was when I walked in there, I was pretty arrogant and I was not aware that I was arrogant. I, I had the concept that everything in the private sector was good and everything in the multilateral public sector was bad. And clearly it's not. What, what works is a combination of things. And, uh, and it's something called the Golden Triangle, which is public sector, private sector, and civil society. And, and it's that system that produces the most innovation and, and velocity and, 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 and really responses to the kind of actions that are required to execute change and to do things differently. Um, but um, bringing that down more specific, uh, a few things came up that I was not conscious of. For example, in terms of motivating uh, people uh, in, in the financial sector, for example, well, it's career development, recognition, and money. Uh, and in some parts of the financial system, it's money, uh, recognition, and career development. In others, it's different, but it's those mix of things, if you will, that make pe people tick and that attract the best talent and retain the best talent and develop the best talent which is what managing people is about. Uh, yet, in the Global Fund, mm. um, I found this new variable, which is passion. Mm. And in health, uh, there is this motivator, which is passion. Mm. And I encountered this extremely brilliant staff at the fund, highly educated, I would be uh, highly engaged, mm. uh, 95 uh, uh, nationalities, with a fantastic level of diversity that that brings with it, gender diversity as well, uh, just a fascinating uh, uh, talent environment. Mm. And there was a common thing, which was passion. Mm. And how to bring passion uh, uh, into that equation of motivating and leading people. Yes. And so that was a great learning experience for Wonderful. me. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, that resonates with a lot of our students because uh, that's the one thing we do bring in public health. Um, I think uh, the other um, 
uh, issue of uh, switching from the private sector to uh, a complex uh, global organization is, is a sort of difference in the stakeholders. You have mentioned the different you know, kinds of sets of stack stakeholders, including civil society and, and uh, uh, donors, implementing countries. I mean, can you describe to us, um, you know, what is the, uh, how did you manage their expectations, the different and sometimes conflicting expect expectations of stakeholders in a complex organization like that? Well, how much time do we have? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> this is at the heart of global health. Right. Uh, and, uh, but I'll, I'll take it in broad brush and different ways. It's a great opportunity to talk about this. Um, it, it, it's, um, what you have is, is very conflicting, um, very conflicting interests on the part of the, of the stakeholders, but they all have something in common, which is the mission. Uh, which is uh, the generosity with, with which they are doing what they're doing. Uh, but other than that, they, they represent uh, very different interests. For example, in the donors, uh, they all want to uh, they provide this money for economic development uh, through uh, improving the health systems and uh, doing away with the, uh, with the pandemics. Mm. Because unless you, unless you do away with them, there will be no economic development, mm. uh, as you know. And, uh, but then they respond to their ministries and to their national agenda. Mm. And that's where the complications come. And uh, of course, uh, the interest in Cuba is different from some angles of the world and from other angles of the world. And the, and the interest on French speaking nations is different from some angles of the world and other angles of the world. And so all that starts competing and that dynamic within the donors is quite a schizophrenic, if you will. And putting that together is something you shouldn't waste your time attempting. You just have to work with it. And uh, because it, it won't, there's this, this too much behind it, the colonial past yeah. of some of these donors and everything else yeah. marks a lot the way they will behave. Yeah. Um, but if that wasn't uh, complex enough, yeah. that has to work with a set of implementing countries. Uh, and um, and the, change, the differences in culture, religions, uh, uh, the significance of women in those societies, the, 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 the diversity, and having interventions and programs that are common and being able to apply and finance them in all those environments is a huge, is a huge venture only to uh, show how diverse they are. And it's in that diversity that you start finding a lot of challenges. And uh, again, that in itself is very complex, but it's heightened and exponentially heightened by the complexity of the donors. And then you have civil society from the north, from the south, civil society from faith-based organizations, academia, researchers, and, and private sector, and all and everything that civil society represents, and NGOs of the north, and those that are in advocacy, and those that are implementers, and, and, and so on and so forth. And they all have different ways to approach uh, some similar uh, missions. And, um, and then you have the people that are affected by the decisions. Right. And they are a major element in civil society. And their anxiety level is different. And their expectations are also different. And so I'm just describing something that is the conflict that you have to deal with. And how you bring them together, I, I don't think I can write that book because I didn't do very well in that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I basically uh, uh, went just head on <laughs> and, and decided to confront all that system yes. and hope that some common threads would come out of it rather than try and fix it. Oh, I see. And try to, har try to harmonize it. Yes. It was too much for, yes. for, a, for a person with my background. <laughs> but getting, getting some very common things out of them, out of them yes. and have them agree on some very uh, common things was my approach. Yes. And Wonderful. I think we got there. That's, that's, that's very good. It was not a happy process. <laughs> no. well, for you, them, you got for me. <laughs> you got results. That's uh, you know, what we want to learn from. I think. Uh, let me um, pause here because I'm, I'm sure that there are lots of people who want to ask questions of uh, Gabriel. Would, would you like to? 
Um, welcome. Um, uh, my name is Leo. I'm an MPH student here in the Healthcare Policy and Management Concentration, and um, we're very glad to have you here. And so you said that um, you can't explain to yourself um, what are you doing here today and how did you get here. And we share something um, because I sometimes feel the same way. I come from a very small uh, town in Argentina, in the center of Argentina. So, um, and I was wondering if you could explain and comment to us a little bit and share what is your um, experience in Colombia and, and what uh, lessons did you learn? What concepts, concepts are you bringing from uh, you know, South America? And wh what are the building blocks that you learned uh, back at home that then were you know, further down the line helpful to build uh, everything that you've built? And the second question would be, what are the lessons that uh, countries, um, especially in South America, can learn from this very complex um, uh, global community and, and global governance uh, issues that we are dealing with? Wow, Leo, I don't even know where to start with you. <laughs> but uh, I guess it's difficult to know because you, you sort of develop as a person over time. And hopefully you're influenced so much over time by your environment and by the people that you meet that at the end you don't know what's from the beginning and what came up along the way. And I had the, uh, I had the uh, fortune of having lived in many countries. I lived in the UK, I lived in California, which is almost a country, <laughs> in Florida, <laughs> in the northeastern part of the US, in Mexico for nine years, in Chile for four, mm. in uh, Brazil for, uh, for nine years. Mm. Uh, and so all around that, I, I guess I picked up along. Um, but um, there, there is a sense of uh, being being uh, a high level of sensitivity for people and uh, comes along with that kind of, 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 of experience that I had. And it's just understanding that people are truly uh, different and the same. And that respecting that difference is, is, is key. People have a right to be different and they are different. And, um, and that respect for that and being receptive to that and sensitive to that at all times is just, uh, I think, uh, something that I can share. I don't know if that's Colombian or Mexican or Brazilian or British or what, <laughs> along the way. Mm. And uh, thank you. Hey, my name is Alfredo Perez. I'm from Colombia. And uh, I know that uh, banking is all about making money. So I guess that was uh, your incentive while you were working um, in that field. Um, so it seems like in the past few years you have been learning a lot more about the public health and the importance of it. So my question for you will be is um, if you could go back, let's say 15 years ago, and at the time you had known more about public health as you know now, would you have done something different? I would have moved into public health faster. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a fascinating world. I, I cannot explain to you the learning curve over the last three years uh, and how it has changed my life and how much I've learned. And uh, of course, I applied. Uh, when you're heading organizations and I was CEO of banks for 21 years, uh, well, you're learning a lot and you're doing a lot and you're exposed a lot and so on and so forth. Uh, but, but with the global health twist, uh, it, it is just so complex, so amazing, so fantastic. And I, I don't have to explain this to you because that's why you're here mm. and the complexity you're learning and teaching and, 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 and you're doing that as you go. You're, you're both. You, I'm sure you learn every day and you, and you teach every day. Um, but uh, the motivation in business, the bottom line is fairly simple and it's uh, return on investment, mm. um, and uh, it is translated to money, and it has to be done in a way that, that it's correct, because if it's correct, then it's sustainable. Mm. And so it has to be ethically correct. Uh, and that is business. Um, in global health, it's morbidity and mortality in a way. Mm. And, uh, and so there is a bottom line as well, but it is more complex. It is, it is more challenging. It is more intellectually difficult to pinpoint. It's not about accountants and accounting rules. And, and you all know the difficulty of being able to match actions today with the effects of morbidity and mortality because they come down the road and they come in different ways. 
and the number of variables that come into play in between what you do and so many others do is so big that you can't really assign them. So accountability becomes different. And uh, so it's a fascinating management challenge. Uh, but from the complexity of the financial world, which is highly complex, uh, and the complexity in, in the health world, clearly the health world is exponentially more complex and therefore, I think, more interesting. Good afternoon. I'm Amia. I'm a master's student in the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department. Thank you uh, for your insights. Uh, my question is about organizational growth. And um, I recognize that on the other side of crisis management is crisis prevention. And I'm curious about the lessons you've learned in the context of crisis prevention um, in terms of how organizations should, should grow to perfect, protect themselves or potentially mitigate such crises. Thank you. So I'll take that as a banker into the area of risk management. <laughs> and um, so what is risk? Risk is anything that can derail your objectives. And you're supposed to identify anything that can derail your objectives. And that is what risk is about. And then the way you go about managing risk is first identify in big clusters the kind of things that can really affect you from being able to accomplish your mission. And they will go always from reputational risk, because if you lose your reputation, there's no way you can accomplish your mission. So that's a constant. To operational risk, which is the risk along the way in the details, like the Tylenol packaging and all these things you can remember, and, um, and so on and so forth. The, the moving, in the, in the case of health medicines, at the right temperature with the right humidity levels within the expiration dates, and, and all those the small but so important uh, uh, details, but important aspects. And so that's operational risk, and that's a constant as well. And you start classifying your risks in these clusters. And then you decide which ones of those can hit you the most suddenly. And you start developing your response to them. And to the extent you do that well, you're managing risk well, and therefore, you're getting ready for all the obstacles that will come up as you work towards accomplishing your mission in whatever human enterprise you're working on. Thank you. Question. So I, I would like to interject on the question about uh, leadership. You have, uh, I, I've uh, heard you say that um, uh, it's easy to uh, be a leader in a well-functioning organization. The, the hallmark of leadership is taking over distressed, you know, ailing institutions and then turning them around as you have. So what, what would you define as the qualities of leadership? What are the most important um, qualities of a leader for you? I mean, is it the, is it the quality of being blunt? Um, or is it the quality of being humble? Uh, is it uh, communication? Is it people skills? I've heard you sort of mention all of these things, but is there a sort of sense in which you would uh, advise future leaders about um, these are the qualities that uh, we, we really ought to keep in the fore of your, forefront of your, of your daily practice? So how to be a leader in seven days and one day. <laughs> and that's what we all want. 60 minutes, actually. <laughs> but there's no such a thing as, 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 as in fact, we don't know what a leader, what, 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 how, do you, how to make a leader and, and what a leader really is. Because leadership is a very personal thing, and people exercise it in different ways. And very difficult, different people with different styles are great leaders. So we haven't quite figured this one out uh, yet. Uh, it's very much like seducing. Everybody seduces differently. <laughs> and, and it's a very personal thing. And if you ask people, how do you seduce? They, they don't really know. But they know, and they perfect it, and out it goes. And so this is leadership. It is not a clear science that you can pinpoint one, two, three. And you're, of course, very aware of that. But then there is some leadership uh, aspects that seem to be common for people to follow. 
and uh, I'll share with you some of the ones that I think uh, are relevant. The first one is one that we mentioned, which is you, you have to have a vision and people have to perceive and demonstrate, you have to demonstrate that you do have a vision, that you can see, that you can read the smoke signals, you can read the times, and you can communicate that you can truly communicate in simple terms uh, what you're seeing. And, um, and then you, you are also uh, have to be able to get into and descend to the, what I call the sweaty little nitty gritty <coughs> of, of the activities that are being done. But once in a while, you have to stop that and go and walk into the future and see the green pastures of where you're going. And people have to see that. And then you have to come back to the sweaty details of agreement and disagreement and knowing and not knowing and trying and failing and all that. And then you have to stop again and you have to go and walk into the future, look at the green pastures and come back. And to the extent that you're repetitively doing that, uh, you, are, you, you will have the capability of having people follow you in whatever the mission that is going to be accomplished. I think another one is one that I mentioned. It is all about people. It's people that do things. And every time you forget that, you pay the price. Because the leader does very little. But a lot of people with different, from different walks of life, with different knowledge bases at the right places can get a lot done. And this is, and those would be three aspects of leadership that I would like to share today. Yes. So um, when you specifically came on board the Global Fund, you had to communicate your vision of the way things were uh, going to change. And um, can you walk us through how you did that? What, what did you do specifically to? So there was a lot of noise in Geneva right. at, at the Global Fund, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, yes. And the world was, was looking at this noise, and everybody was uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, and everybody was unhappy. The donors were unhappy because they didn't think their money was well taken care of. Uh, the, um, the implementing countries were unhappy because the money sometimes came, sometimes it didn't. Ministers being, were being accused of corruption, sometimes unfairly. They didn't have the right platform to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So politically they had a mess in their country, so they wanted to avoid the Global Fund. This was never a good idea, but you know, this is something complicated politically. Civil society, which is closest to the people that are being affected and seeing the realities and the uh, horrific aspects of, of the pandemics that we were fighting, they were aroused because this fund might disappear and, and, and you know, what would happen afterwards and the calamity of something like this being, being affected in the way it was. And the people <laughs> affected by the disease were also uh, shocked and, and scared, uh, terrified in a way, because it's like if somebody had the capability of cutting your oxygen from one minute to the other, and that, that would be a ter horrible fear to have all day. Yeah. That somebody can, can cut your ARV, your, or take your bed nets away, or not replace the bed nets, and these children that you managed to save for four years now are not going to get a replacement. And so, every all my stake, and then the people in the Global Fund, well, there was no direction and they were all lost and everybody was, their self-esteem had been affected by the fact that they were no longer admired. And uh, so all the stakeholders were in disarray when I walked in. And um, so this is how I communicated this to them. Now that you mention it, I said, listen, from in the spectrum of, of the reality of our mission and our venture is basically, uh, you know, from what happens, uh, uh, when a ministry of, of the, or the treasury of a country transfers money into the Global Funds account mm. in, in, uh, in, in the World Bank in Washington to a, an alley in Nairobi where you have a drug addict uh, shooting his drugs or her drugs uh, and what you want is for them to have an illuminated moment when they do that and when they transfer that syringe to the person next to them in that alley, that they actually change the needle, mm. put a new needle, and they transfer that syringe. And that's the moment of truth. And from those two realities, here in the middle is something called Geneva, which is an enabler. It's here to enable that process. And frankly, uh, my friends, 
you're making too much noise. And that little dot in that line is just too noisy. <laughs> and my job here is to organize you people so that nobody even looks at that dot. And this thing from here to there happens and happens in a... And so that was my way of explaining what I was going to do. And I think it did cause an impression. I've heard you say changing from Geneva Centric to, you know, to exactly. the, I, I know I understand what you meant by But it. I didn't use a complicated way to say it. I used that way to say That's it. It's a wonderful image. Thinking. Yes. Uh, are there other questions? I, I'm going to ask this on behalf of the students because uh, I'm sure they're dying to know, which is um, uh, in, in order to manage complex uh, international organizations, do our students need to uh, go across to the business school and, and be getting business degrees? Or is it enough to do a public health degree and to be a leader in this sort of setting? Or does the world demand that um, the skills and qualifications include uh, backgrounds such as yours? So I, 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 I'll answer that with a question yes. <laughs> to you, Mr. Ashir, and it's the following. Yes. Uh, does a doctor have to go to medical school? <laughs> yes. Well, my answer is uh, yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're in agreement. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll elaborate a little bit. I think, uh, yes, management yeah. skills uh, and the practice of management uh, and the disciplines around management have to be learned yeah. and they have to be exercised and uh, a lot of the inefficiency of many of the institutions, specifically in the health world, but through of many other uh, uh, ventures in, in life, uh, are because management is not exercised mm. with the uh, state-of-the-art uh, learnings that, that are available. Mm. And therefore, there's a lot of uh, trial and learning by, 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 by mm. using different uh, methods that are known already, what works, what doesn't, how it should be done. Mm -hmm. And especially when you get down to the very specific disciplines mm -hmm. of, of management, the support areas, the core businesses, mm -hmm. and the control areas, and how they all interplay mm -hmm. in a way that they're mission-oriented and facilitate the mission. Mm -hmm. And so management is a complex, mm -hmm. a complex uh, uh, um, Science, if you can mm. call it that, an art mm. that has to be learned. Yes. Yeah. And uh, and I think we fail by just putting people that don't have a chance of succeeding. Right. They, they then they don't succeed, right. and we're surprised. Yeah. You know, I think uh, you've given us our marching orders. This is the view of the public health leaders of the future. I think, and uh, something that is uh, you know indeed encapsulated in the vision for uh, sort of professional training in the school of uh, public health. Um, I, I'm going to pause here for uh, more questions. I'm sure there are questions that have been percolating in the audience. There'd be, um, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask questions. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lily Muldoon, and I'm a Master's of Public Health candidate in the Global Health and Populations Department. Mm -hmm. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I think that students at the Harvard School of Public Health this academic year are particularly lucky because we have two leaders from the Global Fund who have joined us in Voices from the Field. In November, we heard from Mark Dybel, who had an excellent conversation with Gordon Brown and Dean Frank um, with regards to transforming the global health system. And um, I took away from what he was saying um, the importance of local leadership and result-based development. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you um, what your vision was for the Global Fund today and how it compares to, um, or your vision when you first started working with the Global Fund and how it compares to what the state is today in April of 2014. And then also how you see the Global Fund progressing into the future. That's a great question. Uh, it is much better than I thought uh, it would be. It is the, the, the job that has been done in the continuation of the transformation has been way beyond what I expected could be done in such a period of time. So that theme 
led by Mark, are just fantastic. And uh, it goes to something that we talked a little earlier, which is management. And um, let me just share with you some aspects of this, because I think it will clarify some things. I, I called the first part of the transformation at the fund organizing to deliver. And if you organize well to deliver, uh, you can withstand a lot of changes along the way, even the change of the person at the helm. So we organize to deliver. Little after that, a little time after that, we changed the leader, which I knew was going to happen. And, and that leader was able to start running from the moment that they started, because the place was organized to deliver. And they delivered so much. They delivered going out and raising the funds required with tremendous success. And they delivered by defining the nitty gritty of the new business model and funding model, piloting it out in the field and launching it. All this in 18 months, a fascinating accomplishment. And and I I'm, can't tell you how proud I am, and I know how proud they feel of doing this, and how their self-esteem has grown in ways that, uh, so this is just a very positive thing. Yes. Returning to this theme of crisis management, I think having spent some time in a large multilateral organization, it was obvious to me that change comes very slowly and in, on very difficult terms. And I'm wondering, your experience at the Global Fund was largely born of crisis, or at least perceived crisis, and that's a really good impetus for change in these settings. How can we undertake these types of transformations without that emergency environment? How can we motivate donors and, and member countries to think very differently about structuring organizations or organizing to deliver when there isn't scandal looming? So. I guess, in a way, the Global <coughs> Fund was lucky because its auditor published this fraud, and the communications department was just so sloppy in the way they responded. If they had responded well, the Global Fund wouldn't have had a, a high-level panel, and perhaps no change would have taken place, and they would have continued in denial, and they would have uh, not raised $12 billion, that's for sure. Uh, but thanks to the fact that the communications department responded to a crisis in the wrong way, uh, it created a crisis. <laughs> and of course, the crisis created a sense of urgency, which is what you're saying. And around the sense of urgency, you undertake a total overhaul of an organization, not just the problems in the communications department. Uh, the problems in the communications department, if I can, uh, and here's Jay, who's an expert in this field. Uh, but from my perspective, uh, the auditor, called the Inspector General, of the fund found fraud. And, uh, but of course, the auditor is always going to find fraud, because all you need to have fraud is people and money. <laughs> Anytime you have people and money, you have fraud. <coughs> if you don't have it, it's because you're not good at looking for it. But there's fraud of some kind uh, in any culture, in any venture. And you have to continuously, from a risk management point of view, be there cornering it. And to the extent that you can, then you'll have less. And it'll be less of a significant factor. This communications department, when fraud was found, decided to answer in a way which is, well, what do you expect from us? Uh, we are here to save lives. Do you want us to be out there getting receipts? <laughs> and, and so that only triggered another headline, and another headline, and another headline. And the more they answered, the more headlines they are. But had they answered to the first, uh, to the first report on fraud, which was simply a reporter saying, hey, your auditor said this, and I'm just telling the world what your auditor said. Uh, if they had said something in the line of saying, you know what, our auditor, we ourselves, because we have zero tolerance for fraud, we look for it wherever it is, and we report it. And they did find it, and nobody is more offended than we are. And we will pursue it to the most final consequences. 
and we will try and recoup this money. And our uh, Inspector General, our auditor, will continue looking. And if we find it one way, we will stop that, and we will find another way, and we will continuously fight it. If that had been the response, there would be no headline the following day. It would have not been news. Um, how do you create a sense of urgency is your question. You have to create it. You have to create it. You have to with your visioning, be able to, in, simple, in a simple way of communicating, show people that you're going at 100 miles an hour against the world, even if you look successful. And once you achieve that, you created the sense of urgency for change. You might be lucky. Something might hit you, like it hit the fund. And you ride on that and execute your change. But if not, you can create it, and I think it's around your visioning and saying, you know, this has, that has us so happy here and we think we're so great. Well, look at what's happening, and perhaps we have a problem coming to us. And if people perceive that, now you created your sense of urgency and you move. It's a profound uh, lesson. Any other? I mean, I think uh, in addition to the, the uh, vision that you described, you know, the structural change that you also made when you came on board, which harks back to the, your lesson about the importance of management, that um, you made structural changes in the Global Fund where you uh, pulled the institution back to its uh, core model of grants management. I think um, the you know, people in our financial administration would, like, would love to hear that, that uh, this, you, know, you really I mean, in a, in a way, I see this as how your private sector experience came to bear and, um, and it bore fruit, obviously. Because it would, would you elaborate on you know, those so kinds of structural changes you made to management? So when you're doing you're, change, you're doing a lot of things. Right. And, and, and it looks pretty chaotic to everybody, especially when you're doing it because it's like the sausage factory. Mm. It's, it, you know, everything is in play and some things are working, some are not. Some people are going with one change, some people are reacting to it. And so it's a very dynamic process and a very complicated process. It's a messy process. Uh, but conceptually, when you're executing change, you're doing it around two basic things. The first one is the internal aspects, which are really not important until they don't function. But, but when they are functioning, you don't even think about it. So it's like the light. It's only something when it, when it doesn't turn on. But if it's on, it's what they should do, so nothing happens. So the internal things, you have to get them out of the way and fix them. And that's what I call organizing to deliver. And get that done. And in fact, take very little time doing it. Do it fast. And um, essentially, uh, ask, I even apologize for having to do that. Say, you know, we're going to look at our, our, at our belly button for a little while here, and we're going to fix things internally and get it out. Once you've done that, then you go into another area, which is the business model of the organization. How is it that it has decided it's going to accomplish its mission? And that is the external aspect, and that is the real change. Now, people perceive that the real change is the reductions in workforce, the new organizational um, uh, structures, the announcements of who goes, who comes, who takes over, new department, new this, new that, responsibilities, and this and the other. That is really the first part, which is the internal part. Yeah. In itself alone, it doesn't do much. It means that you go from a disorganized mess to an organized mess. <laughs> but that's all it does. The second part is the one you have to want, you want to tackle, and that's the intellectual part and the real thought process of how do we go about doing what we do differently? What are the game changers? What are all these? But the organization has to be settled and well thought through and implemented. And so in the second part, which is the new funding model of the fund, the new business model of the fund, and everything that has been done in the last 18 months, that is, in essence, the real transformation of our organization. Mm. And separating conceptually those two things helps when you're undertaking this very messy thing. That's a very useful division of internal and external. 
Um, I think uh, we're just about at time. We could go on listening to uh, Gabriel, but um, I'd like to spend you know the few minutes remaining uh, to a ask you to summarize. You know, if, if there are sort of take-home messages that um, everyone can take away from this. What are the you know main uh, lessons that you have to impart to our students and our viewers and listeners about leadership? What um, what are these qualities, and uh, what have you learned? You know, things that work, things that haven't worked. Can you reflect for a few minutes on that, Gabriel? I think interpreting the times right. and being able to communicate that is an mm. essential part of a leader. I think being sensitive to people mm. and to the differences in people and, and, differ and, and, and being sensitive to opinions and different opinions and allowing a debate. But of course, after the debate, being able to conclude. And once concluded, decisions are made, and that is what gets done. And uh, that this is very, very important. And you get the best out of innovation and creativity and, and people if a debate does take place. And even though it looks like it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's wasted time, it's really accelerating your execution enormously, exponentially, down the road, because the discussion took place at the beginning and different aspects were. Now, this does not mean that everybody has to like it and agree. It means that everything was listened to, and with the best information available, a decision was made to go one way. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's a, a very important aspect uh, of leadership. Um, I think you have to take advantage of quick wins. Because when you're undertaking a humongous change, you can't tell people, let's do this, because by the year 2014, you're going to be very proud of it, and it will work. Because, it, because they, you, you get tired. So you have to take care of little tricks. And I'll give you a little example of a little trick in the Global Fund. The trick is the wrong word. The elevators were not synchronized. <laughs> and the elevator hall was very big. And you had two elevators on one side, two elevators on the other. You push your button to go down, and you were here. And that elevator over there in the other corner was the one going down. And you had to run over there before the door closed. And this didn't make any sense. <laughs> and, and I looked at this, and I called the person that was in the administration, and I said, what's with these elevators? And he said, no, it can't be fixed. It's like this here. And I said, well, you fix it. And he said, it can't be done. And I said, that means that you don't know how I'll get somebody that does if you don't. And that was it. Trying to explain to me why it couldn't work. And I said, listen, I'm too busy saving lives. You fix your <laughs> elevators. You fix your elevators. And this nice person went and fixed the elevators. And I didn't say anything to anybody. But people noticed immediately. And they said, boy, change is happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, this place is really changing. <laughs> and so this tells you. <laughs> you have to so, take advantage of quick, quick wins, I call it. <laughs> That's a great lesson. Oh, well, I'm, I'm not sure that we should take away from that. You know, we, we, in public health, of course, we, we would make uh, using the elevator more difficult as a <laughs> way of encouraging people to walk the stairs. But anyway, I, I think um, it's been um, a wonderful hour, Gabriel. I think that in spite of your um, words at the beginning, uh, where you said uh, it's you know every leader is different. Uh, it's impossible to to teach people about uh, leadership. I think we have in fact learned a great deal from your wisdom and um, your, your experiences. And it's been a real uh, honor to have you. Um, I think uh, if, if, if there's you know, a dying, someone with a question they've been dying to ask, I know um, in the format we haven't been able to have as much interaction as I'd hoped. But um, if there is someone who would like to ask uh, a question before we uh, thank Gabriel. No, then uh, I think you know. I thank you very much for your wonderful uh, lessons today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.